Thank you for taking the time to join us today for today's ICC webinar, which will cover how your community can access the $137 million in the fiscal year 2023 Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, or BRIC, grant program that FEMA has dedicated for what it calls the Building Code Plus Up. We will be recording today's webinar, which will be posted to YouTube as quickly as possible in case you need to drop early or want to share this information with anyone else who might benefit from it. My name is Aaron Davis, and I am the Vice President for Federal Relations here at the Code Council. I'll briefly walk through our agenda for the webinar. First, we'll begin with an overview of, of, of the experts joining us today. Next, some high-level background on the revolutionary BRIC program and ICC's efforts to bring these resources to bear. Then you will hear directly from federal and state officials who are administering BRIC grants. We'll then hear how the Code Council can assist your community with applications for a piece of the Codes Plus Up. Finally, you'll hear directly from a community that has received a BRIC award for a code-related project. All the while, please feel free to type any questions into the Q&A box of this WebEx for any of our panelists. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible as part of today's program. Additional information, including answers to frequently asked questions, can be found on the Code Council's website at iccsafe.org slash brick, as well as FEMA's website at fema.gov slash brick. Next up, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have assembled an incredible group of experts for you to learn from today. Camille Crane is the BRIC Section Chief at FEMA Headquarters, responsible for the design and administration of FEMA Hazard Mitigation Assistance's newest grant program. She arrived at FEMA Headquarters from FEMA Region 6, where she served as the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Branch Chief and managed three HMA grant programs in excess of $3 billion of mitigation funding for Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, and the 68 federally recognized tribes located in the region. She also spent time in FEMA Region 4, working closely with the states of Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi to ensure consistency in the grant programs and effective training for state, local, and tribal officials working to access federal assistance. Prior to FEMA, Camille was the state hazard mitigation officer for the Commonwealth of Kentucky, where she managed the Commonwealth's hazard mitigation grant program and planning and leading the effort for the approval of the Kentucky State Enhanced Hazard Mitigation Plan. Camille started her emergency management career at the University of Kentucky and brings over 20 years experience with FEMA's HMA grant programs at the university, state, and federal levels. Russell Strickland was appointed as the secretary of the Maryland Department of Emergency Management in October of 2021, having previously been appointed as the executive director of the Maryland Emergency Management Agency in July 2015. In this role, Mr. Strickland leads a department that has the primary responsibility and authority for emergency preparedness policy and for coordinating hazard mitigation, incident response, and disaster recovery for the state of Maryland. This includes serving as a direct advisor to the governor during disasters and coordinating support for local governments as requested. Additionally, Mr. Strickland was just elevated last month to serve as the president of the National Emergency Management Association and has long served on NEMA's Resilience Committee. Mr. Strickland is an experienced emergency management professional with more than 40 years of experience in the field of emergency services and first responder activities at the state and local levels of government, academia, and the private sector. This includes expertise in fire and rescue services, emergency medical services, fire inspection and investigation, communications, and emergency management leadership. Stella Carr is the Energy and Resilience Project Manager here at ICC. Her role at the Code Council is to support members in taking full advantage of the federal grants available for building code activities. She developed a grant basics for code officials training for ICC members and has helped 12 states secure funding through the United States Department of Energy's RECI Grants Program in 2023. She is continuously working on resources to make the application process for BRIC and other federal grants easier for our members. We are also joined by Crystal Samuels and Terry Biggie from Greene County, Virginia, who will share their experience with you later in the program. Next, I'll provide a brief overview of BRIC. FEMA's BRIC 
program is the successor program to the earlier pre-disaster mitigation or PDM program. BRIC now serves as the agency's primary pre-disaster mitigation grant program. BRIC is the result of the Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018 and is the outcome of years of frustration in Congress and amongst those in the emergency management space over inconsistent amounts of federal assistance before disaster strikes. Following decades of increasingly more devastating and costly natural disasters, Congress established a pre-disaster mitigation program funded using a calculation of prior year's disaster costs. Understanding just how much bang for the buck mitigation investments reduce disaster-related losses. Of all mitigation activities, adoption and enforcement of modern consensus-based building codes has been proven to provide an 11 to 1 return on investment for base codes and even greater returns on investment for above code provisions. BRIC funding can be used to support building code adoptions and code implementation. FEMA also considers applicants adopted codes in its evaluation of brick and mortar mitigation pr proposals. BRIC provides funding by formula to state, tribal, and territorial governments with remaining funds to be provided for mitigation projects through a national competition. State, tribal, and territorial governments are BRIC applicants, while local governments are sub applicants. Each state has internal deadlines, but one constant is that the federal share of, of this assistance is always at least 75%. All of the information on this slide can be found on our website, iccsafe.org slash brick, and we are trying to keep up with any changes at the state level regarding shifting deadlines given the impact of the near federal shutdown earlier this fall and the delay it caused with the re release of the brick NOFO. You can reach out to your ICC state lead or Stella with any questions regarding state or territorial deadlines. For instance, just yesterday, we learned of a state that established a separate later internal deadline for applications for building code plus up grants. And we've been in touch with other states regarding similar flexibility as well. Next slide. Next slide. Here you can see two things. First is the increasing federal investment in BRIC over the last three years. Second is that you have an advantage in bringing federal grant funds to benefit your departments for code related projects. FEMA and other national level policymakers often cite the congressionally directed National Institute of Building Sciences mitigation saves report for this statistic I mentioned earlier about the 11 to 1 return on investment. Um, the new building code plus up is consistent with the current White House's goals in the national initiative to advance building codes as well as with the priorities of FEMA administrators and directors going back several administrations. Strong building codes save lives and reduce disaster costs. With that, I'll turn it over to Camille Crane from FEMA. Thank you so much, Aaron, and thank you so much to the International Code Council for hosting this webinar today about this really monumental change or in our program to dedicate have a dedicated funding source for code work. Um, we know the importance, as Aaron talked about, of having uh, codes, building codes particularly, in communities and in, in having a foundation for communities resilience. And so we wanted to this year to really be able to offer a dedicated funding source through our program. And we're happy to be able to talk about that today. So as we go to the next slide, I'm gonna spend a few minutes with you driving in deep across the somewhat deep, let me say, across the BRIC program for this year for fiscal year 23, starting with kind of overall and then how the, the building code plus up actually works within the program. So I always like to start in conversation about the BRIC program, talking about our priorities for this fiscal year. Um, and they are the same as our priorities for last fiscal year. So that is um, because the program has a focus on supporting disadvantaged populations being adaptive uh, or um, responsive to increasing hazards as a result of climate change and then supportive of building codes. So as those remain administration and agency priorities, the program keeps those as, as its priority as well. So you'll see on here the priorities for this year um, as they were last year. And that is incentivizing natural hazard risk reduction activities that mitigate multi hazard risk to public infrastructure and disadvantaged communities as referenced in executive order 14008. 
We want to incorporate nature-based solutions, including those that are designed to reduce carbon emissions. So in our project work, how are we looking at natural ways um, or green infrastructure, for example, to construct those projects? We want to enhance climate resilience and adaptation through the projects that we fund and then increase funding to applicants to facilitate the adoption and enforcement of the latest edition of building codes. Um, our projects overall, um, we like it when they result in or meet multiple of these program priorities. But today we're particularly gonna focus on that last priority about increasing funding to applicants to facilitate the adoption and enforcement of the latest building codes. So next slide, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the funding available overall for the BRIP program this year. So our funding available for the FY23 program is a billion dollars. That billion dollars divides up in a few different ways or what we call funding buckets. The first is um, what we've always had in the program, which is a state and territory allocation. This is the same as it was last year in 2022 at $2 million per state and territory. And a state and territory can use that funding to apply for both capacity and capability building project types, as well as mitigation project types. Building codes is a part or is in um, one of the four different components of a capacity and capability building activity. So building code projects have always been eligible under this state and territory allocation. They continue to be eligible. You'll see on, or you saw on one of Aaron's previous slides, he talked about some of the numbers as far as what's been submitted to the BRIC program for building codes before. So this is how they came in before. The new part is what's the next bullet, which is our building codes plus up, which is our addition to our program in FY23 and why we're here talking about this today. So we wanted to have a dedicated funding source to fund building code activities. While it has been an eligible activity in the program since the program's inception in with the fiscal year 20 program, we have not seen a lot of applications come in. And one of the reasons we believe is because it had to compete with other eligible activity types under a limited state and territory allocation. That allocation has increased as Aaron showed from 600 to a million to now $2 million. And that's what it was last year as well. But it still can be a smaller pot when it's also competing with mitigation projects, mitigation planning, partnerships, and other project scoping. So what we did is, as we really wanted to have a focus or we have a priority on funding this type of work, we kept created a dedicated funding source at another $2 million for state and territory that they could apply for just building code activities. In addition, we created a additional set aside for our federally recognized tribes. So our tri federally recognized tribal nations do not have access or do not get their own allocation, but we do have a set aside that is for them to, to apply for both capacity and capability building project types, as well as mitigation project types. Um, that set aside is the same as it was in 2022 at $50 million. But in addition, we've added another $25 million dedicated for federally recognized tribes to apply for building code work. So you end up with the $2 million per state and territory, so $112 million dedicated for state and territories to do building code work, and $25 million for federally recognized tribal nations to do building code work. The balance of our funds is used in our national competition for mitigation projects. That's roughly about $701 million if you subtract all the set-asides and um, allocations out from the billion dollars. Um, tribal work, I'm, I'm sorry, building code work is not eligible in the national competition. Um, states and territories can submit an unlimited number of sub applications to the national competition. Each one of those can have a value of up to $50 million a piece, federal share. As we go to the next slide, it's going to talk a little bit more here about um, what the building codes plus up is. So as this slide states, you can still apply for building code work under your standard state and territory allocation and tribal set aside. This is just an addition. So for example, if a state decided they wanted to do nothing but building code work, they actually would have $4 million across their allocation and their, and their building code plus up. 
but you can still do it in both. But of course we would, um, we're really trying to promote the building code plus up monies be used. Um, this can work with, you can see on the graphic on the right, as I've talked about, this is one of four different capacity and capability building project types. What can be done with this work includes adoption and enforcement of building code activities and standards. Um, and we'll go in the, in the next slide a little bit more about this. So as we go to the next slide, it gives you another snapshot of the dedicated funding for the, both the building codes plus up as well as for state and territories as well as this tribe. And then the, the three major buckets that of work that can be included. Um, first is talking about the evalu evaluating the adoption or implementation of codes. So um, of building codes, particularly of the latest building codes. So whether that is your community or state. Um, and for reference, we do eligible to, to apply for building code work um, could be at the state level, could be at a local level, a tribal or a territorial level. Um, it could be, a, so it could be evaluating the adoption of the latest building codes. It could be implementing those codes. So helping fund the cost to implement those codes. It could be enhancing existing adopting codes that it might incorporate higher standards. So, for example, if you look at the building code effectiveness grading schedule, what is known as BSEGS, and you have a rating that is done through that survey, um, you may be able to fund or you should be able to fund activities that would help you increase that rating. And then the last category we have is about development of professional workforce. So, whether that is through professional development training or other technical assistance um, in having the workforce capable to um, implement and enforce building codes. Next slide. I'm very excited that we have today um, Green County, Virginia on to talk about their experience. I wanted to give you some snapshots of other projects that have been selected through the first couple of years of the BRIC program to, to give you some real life examples of how this looks like through um, projects that have been submitted and selected. So looking across these examples that are on the screen for you, you have ones that are coming from all levels of um, governmental organizations. So there's tribal, territorial, local, and state examples. We have them mapped across those three different categories of adoption and, and implementation, enhancing, and training. Um, I have checked with International Code Council. I'm very excited. Thank you, International Code Council, so much that they will be posting these slides um, in a PDF form to their website after this webinar because I want it, I want you to be able to have copies of this um, because both for this kind of information, but also in a slide I'm about to share in a few minutes where it talks about some application tips in how to actually apply in our system. So as we go to our next slide, this is going to talk about how do you apply through a system. So our applications come through the FEMA Grant Outcomes or FEMA Go portal. You do have to register um, in that portal um, on, the, on the website to be able to submit an application. And so you'll see links on this slide that will direct you to that portal as well as to some of the um, technical assistance pages or information about the system. So the application period is open now. It opened on October 16th, um, 2023, and it closes on leap day. So February 29th, 2024 at 3 p.m. Eastern. Please note that we do ask or we do require that if you're going, if you have any system issues, you submit help desk tickets and you notify FEMA at least 48 hours in advance um, of the application deadline. So we can try to work through being able, be, having you be able to submit your application on time. So that is February 27th at 3 p.m. Um, I will note that uh, tip there, submit early. Other thing, very big tip is please note these are FEMA's deadlines for its applicants. So those are states, territories, and federally recognized tribes. If you're a local government, a state, as Aaron talked about, is going to have internal deadlines before the FEMA deadline. So you need to ensure that you are closely working with state hazard mitigation officers and other state officials 
or other state officials in those um, offices to make sure you understand the deadlines and you're meeting the requirements of those applicants. The next slide is giving you some in FEMA Go how you would actually submit your application. So how you would fill out for a building code application, including which project type to use um, or which application form to use, which is the, the projects of application type. It includes how to answer certain, certain fields in that application. Um, and so once again, if you're thinking about applying, I certainly recommend um, downloading a copy of this presentation. And then the next slide is to give you more helpful tips or give you direct um, information and directions about where to get more information, including the BRIC website that Aaron talked about at the front of FEMA.gov forward slash BRIC. Um, copies where to go on grants.gov to get our notice of funding opportunity and links to all of our programmatic support materials. In particular, for this conversation, we have dedicated a programmatic support material to understanding more about um, this building codes plus up and building code activities and what is eligible and how to apply. And that document lives there. And then with that, I think the next slide is my closing slide. So I am going to turn it over to Mr. Ref Slick Russ Strickland to talk from, from his perspective as president of the National Emergency Management Association. Russ, over to you. Great. Thank you, Camille. And uh, thank you to everybody for taking the time to be uh, with us today. Um, I can't tell you how exciting I think this is. If you think back a, a mere four or five years ago, depending upon how you're counting your years, where we were dealing with $50 million nationwide competitively that we could use for hazard mitigation assistance, particularly in the in the strictly mitigation area. And today to be talking about billions of dollars um, is absolutely phenomenal. To share with everybody that's on the call today, if you're not familiar with the National Emergency Managers Association, it's made up of the 50 states, the six territories, and the District of Columbia. So each of those jurisdictions or states has a um, state appointed emergency manager. And whatever that may be is the individual who represents the state within the association and the association really operates as a forum sharing information across all the states territories in the district of Columbia, as well as. Uh, being a voice in Washington being the voice with FEMA to represent really the whole of community from a nationwide uh, perspective. But along that line, we all respect the fact that if you have seen one state, you have seen one state and that each of our states are different and that we have got to recognize the fact that things are not the same in each in each individual state um, and that we need to be flexible and be able to kind of bend uh, accordingly to uh, set up the mitigation programs in each of our states. But this this program is really supporting and encouraging mitigation and I have a personal comment and that is that mitigation is the center of the universe but I recognize very very clearly two things one all events are local and two when we talk about before during and after a disaster we will always have disasters and we have got to be prepared to handle those and go into recovery but as Aaron mentioned at the beginning if we would invest appropriately we can lower the amount of money that is needed for recovery. And that, that comes out to basically assisting and helping the survivor, which is what we really, really, really want to push for. So with that too, um, I really want to emphasize uh, some of the comments that Camille was making. And that is that, you know, you need to contact your state emergency management entity. Uh, talk to them because we may have some different timelines in-house trying to get this program up and running and moving forward. Um, and they will be your direct line of communications, your direct consulting, your direct technical assistance to get it moving for your local level. And to sit down and talk with you and realize that you may not be ready for submittal of a project this year, but that we can help you prepare as we go through a year and, and get your project up to 
what would be uh, that that could be either one accepted as a state project through that cutout or would be a good competitive project as we would move forward. The code plus up, that is absolutely phenomenal. Um, again, is we're addressing before the disaster strikes, we want to do as much mitigation as possible and to bring codes online with every local community, every jurisdiction, every state is absolutely essential. That's the way we're going to start to protect property better, stronger, and that's the way we'll save lives. And I think that's extremely important. Uh, I also think the idea of the uh, uh, community disaster resiliency zones and the responsibility of each state to focus on that is is an absolute too. And that ties to you know the uh, the building codes and the necessity there. So again, we realize some of this has hit us uh, rather quickly uh, with the uh, notice of a of funding opportunity being released, but it is an incredible opportunity for us to greatly improve at our local uh, and state levels. And we applaud and thank FEMA uh, for their efforts with all of this. And at the same time, we pledge our support to FEMA to continue with this. And at the same time, we'll bring the words and the comments from the states forward uh, to FEMA to see how we can improve and make the uh, program workable for everyone that's involved. We'll continually be pushing for simplicity and efficiency as we move forward with all of these programs. So again, um, I think we're really here to support uh, FEMA, to support the ICC in getting the message out to rely on both of them as partners in this process and to work very, very closely within the whole community of our individual states to utilize this funding as uh, uh, effectively as possible. So with that, I'll, I'll be quiet and uh, pass it on here, but it, uh, uh, looking forward to any time we might have at the end to have any questions and chat as we go through this. Thank you, Russ. We're now going to go to Stella Carr from ICC. Thank you, Aaron, and thanks everyone so far for the questions we've been receiving in the Q and A. Um, as we continue, if you have more questions, please feel free to enter them, and we will um, do our best to answer them as we go. And also during the question portion of the webinar, we will discuss them for everyone. Um, and just so everyone's aware, we will be posting the recording on our YouTube channel within the next few days and posting that link on our BRIC website, as well as links to the uh, presentation in PDF form. So you will be able to get a copy of this and share it um, with any of your colleagues or listen again um, if you need to. So I'm excited to be here today speaking with everybody about how the Code Council will help you through this process. And I'm also available for other grants that we work on. So today we're focusing on BRIC. And um, if you'll move to the next slide, Lisa, I will um, cover what we are available to assist with for this opportunity. So something that Camille covered was some examples of past projects, and I'll have another slide going into detail of some other examples. We're here to be a thought partner in helping you develop your scope of work, figuring out what type of project will meet the needs of your community, as well as qualify and be eligible within the scope of BRIC and the Building Code Plus Up program. And so we are available to share past successes that we've seen, through the BRIC program, talk about what we see other communities doing and what they're interested in utilizing the funding for as well, and really help you to hone in what you want to utilize um, this grant for and how to be, develop a successful application. We have materials from previous successful applications in years prior, and we're continuing to get our hands on more of those so that we can learn from that and share those um, learnings with you all so that you can see what was successful about those applications, understand what pitfalls you can avoid, and also to 
um, develop certain template materials. We're actively working on developing template uh, grant materials for you to use to have a starting point to jump off for when you're developing your scopes of work and project summaries and other items like that. And we can also work with you um, in supporting getting quotes and materials, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more when it comes to budgeting and understanding how much the things you're trying to accomplish with your grant will cost and what you will need um, in order to get that done for the application. Additionally, we have training here at ICC, which we just launched at the annual conference on grant uh, training for grant basics for code officials. And in that class, we cover general tips for how to you know apply for this type of grant and other federal grants and understanding that and so we have other resources and general education and information about how to be uh, develop a successful grant proposal how the process works and we will be doing um, a deep dive into the BRIC application process so right now we're doing you know high level what BRIC is how you can utilize the funding and some examples and later this month on the 29th of November during our learn live session for ICC members we will be doing a deep dive into BRIC and helping to give you some uh, more detailed tips and how to successfully go through that application process and hopefully walk you through actually what the application looks like um, some examples of things that you can utilize if you'll move to the next slide Lisa of previously funded code activities. So these are things that BRIC has already seen applicants from in the capability and capacity building applications in the three years prior and that have been funded. So if you see a, an example on here that you're thinking of doing for your community, we can help you to understand how you can utilize this funding for that program. But just because it's not on here doesn't mean that you can't do it. Uh, these are just ones that we've seen successful. So for example, if you're looking to do a statewide training program or even a regional training program for codes, um, developing adoption and enforcement activities in your community, as well as we've seen a few um, building department accreditation examples, remote virtual inspections, um, the, the when disaster strikes training that ICC offers you can um, roll that out in your community and then for tribal communities you could do a uh, code adoption effort you could do uh, resilient building code implementation and exploring you know what a territory wide uh, code update might be for our territories who might be on the call uh, so really the possibilities are wide and uh, it's helpful to know what has worked in the past for BRIC but also um, talking with you, we can help you to figure out what might not have been done in the past, but is still eligible to be funded. Um, next slide, Lisa. So some of the solutions that ICC has available, which will qualify for BRIC funding, could be um, getting a digital codes premium subscription for your community. So if you're currently just using um, code books and you want to go to the digital age for your community, you could use the funding to get um, you know, tablets so that you can utilize the code and reference it out in the field and be able to pull up whatever codes you need at the palm of your hands and your phone as well. And those subscriptions could be for your whole community or for just the departments that, um, the, you know, certain number of people that need it. We also have third party plan review services. So for communities that need extra help with reviewing plans and permitting and, you know, you want to outsource that if you're having staffing issues and challenges or you just have so much that your departments can't keep up with, uh, this is a viable option as well. Additionally, if you're looking to transition to an e-permitting tool like Municity, um, permitting software and transitioning um, any type of digital implementation for a code department would be eligible for BRIC. And I've heard a lot of interest from communities in updating their records management and digitizing files because, you know, they can take up a lot of space and many states have requirements of how you need to hold on to them. And it can be cumbersome to manage those files when you have to search through um, records physically. And so um, it is a very expensive process I'm learning from communities who are interested in doing it. And that would be something that you could utilize um, in addition to other things within the grant to 
digitize those files, make sure that they're accessible and ready so that in the case of a disaster and you need to fully, um, you know, find those files quickly and respond to things, um, you know, having them accessible in a digital format would be um, a, a means to improve that process and make uh, resilient, make your communities more responsive um, when disasters do happen. Uh, remote virtual inspections are something we've seen an increase in our um, St. Paul, Minnesota spoke on our last webinar about their experience um, using BRIC to implement a remote virtual inspection program. And so this is something that is newer for communities, but can be really beneficial. And so we have other resources if you want to learn about that and why it's something you might want to do. And if you're already interested in doing it, that could be a great BRIC project as well. Um, additionally, if you have specific interests in developing a code for your community or for your state, uh, custom local building codes and development of that could be something that you utilize with BRIC. And, you know, these are just some things to get your ideas and wheels turning so that you can think about what your needs might already be in your community and how you can match that with BRIC funding. Or if you haven't thought about this, how to Think about um, moving into the future what your community will need. It's important to understand, you know, the application process will happen over the next couple of months. And then there is the review process and the time it takes to actually negotiate and be selected. And when your project will start is probably not for another 12 to 18 months from now. And so thinking ab about a year to a year and a half ahead, what does your community need and what will you need funding for? And, you know, the, this is how you want to plan for it so that you're, you know, this is not money you're going to get next month. Uh, so there is sort of a lead time to when you can actually implement these projects and get the funding to support them. So that's something to keep in mind what when you're thinking, what do we need to do? It's not what you need next month, not even next summer, but a year or two from now, because the projects also take place over about a three year term. So it will be. Um, you know, about four years from now when these projects would be complete. And so um, just a few things to consider. And um, when the Code Council is here, if you're interested to reach out to me or your GR rep and we can get connected uh, on our BRIC website, iccsafe.org back black backslash brick we have uh, updated resources for you uh, to learn more about what i've spoken with you here we'll continue to update that as we develop more resources we also have a link to a resource which shares uh, the up-to-date deadlines for states regarding what those state deadlines are because as camille mentioned the fema deadline which states apply for is in, in february but many of the states have notice of intent deadlines Um, and additional um, deadlines for the sub applicants and those might be just a month from now and so uh, we are continuing to update that as we get more information so that we can work with you to meet those deadlines and get the resources that you need and if you're interested in utilizing the grants for any of these services that I just discussed um, you'll probably need a quote from us about that so I will help to connect you with the relevant departments so that you can understand how much these projects will cost and include that information in your proposals. So um, be sure to reach out and schedule a meeting to chat with me if you're looking to take advantage of um, this funding opportunity and we can continue the conversation. So um, I don't believe there's another slide for me, Lisa, but I'll say next slide just in case. I will pass it over to our community who has successfully had a BRIC award just recently. And so they're going to talk about their application process and the journey, because that is where you are all beginning right now. And so um, I welcome Terry Biggie to talk about the county of um, the Green County in Virginia and their application from just this past BRIC cycle. Thank you so much for having us on here. I don't believe Crystal is available. So it'll be just me. Uh, so I hope that's all right. But um, I'm the grant writer for the County of Green in Virginia, and we are a very small county. This was our first time applying for this, and we found out about it through the CC. So that was really exciting. 
Um, we apply through our Virginia Department of Emergency Management. And the line for Virginia is, I believe, November 22nd um, for those who might be in Virginia. And we decided to focus on improving our permitting, um, modernizing it using electronic permitting, um, and to improve the um, uh, I'll tell you what we're doing. Okay. Um, so we're going to be able to track cases uh, of uh, complaint to resolution. We're going to um, be allowed to able to use mobile devices in the field when doing this. Then we will also be um, using. Uh, we are purchasing a flatbed scanner that will allow us to do co um, plan reviews on a large screen. Uh, right now, we just have a table with tons of plans on them, which makes it very difficult to locate if needed. We're going to also be doing some of the uh, modernization of the records, digitizing of our records, and we're going to be doing uh, training in the both the building department and planning and zoning department um, for when disaster strikes. And, uh, and I believe we're going to have training also for um, in the building inspections department, which is only uh, two people right now to allow them to both have the credentials for commercial and residential. And um, we're going to include new forms for asbestos inspection, asbestos inspection. We do not currently have that right now. We also currently don't have the right forms for backflow. So this will allow us to increase some of that. And so that's that's where we are. It's the first time we've ever applied for, for this. So I don't really know what else to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Terry, for sharing uh, your experience. Uh, with us today, we've um, had several uh, questions come in via the Q and A, um, and we are answering them. I don't know if uh, if Camille, if you'd like to take, um, if you'd like to address any of the questions about BSEGs and and where that stands with regard to the Code Plus up uh, portion of of the BRIC uh, grant program um, versus the nationally competitive. Uh, piece of the BRIC program. Um, I think there's some interest in that uh, on that 1. Absolutely. Um, so, to note, we do have a series of competition criteria that are in the program. Um, it goes off of the, the competition criteria is a 200 point system. It goes off the priorities of the program. So it focuses around are the projects infrastructure. Do the projects um, can contain nature based solutions? Are they coming from disadvantaged communities? The projects. What's the building code adoption um, at state and local levels? And are those building codes being enforced? We have it on is the project um, climate adaptive or is it a result of climate change or other future conditions? We have partnerships, we have outreach. So those are all of our competition criteria um, or most of them, I should say. Those are points that are assigned to projects that are in our national competition. So that is our 700 plus million dollars of um, just mitigation projects. The national, the state and territory allocation, the tribal set aside, and the building code plus ups for state and territories and for nationally recognized tribes do not have the national competition criteria assigned to them. So we do not we do not grade them or rank them against against any kind of competition criteria. Our applicants, so the state territories and the tribal. Um, federally recognized tribes prioritize the funding that they have dedicated to them and submit applications prioritized to that funding and we go by that prioritization. Um, the reason that we use the building code effectiveness grading schedule in our national competition is it does something for us. So one of the things like what it allows us to do is not just look at code adoption, but actually how codes are being implemented and enforced in a community. And it lets us do that in a very quick way. Um, so we, the for awareness, the building code effectiveness grading schedule was a competition criteria in our predecessor program as well, the pre-disaster mitigation program, PDM. 
we kept that as one of our competition criteria. We have a relationship with ISO that um, administers that. They have created dedicated inboxes. They offer free um, surveys to communities. They will have dedicated resources to be able to turn around those surveys pretty quickly um, based on the size of the community. Uh, so there is not a cost to a local government to be able to get a survey, to get the survey, to get the, the rating from ISO. Um, and the points in the brick competition are as if you have a um, BSEX rating of one through five, because I've worked with others at FEMA, particular in our building sciences, to understand that the those ratings of one through five indicate that the community has a disaster resistant code and is implementing that code for full efficiency or for full effectiveness. Um, so, and then I will say on my slides, there was a, um, a listing of our programmatic support materials. We have programmatic support materials for both our, um, the technical criteria side of our national competition, as well as the qualitative criteria side of our national competition. And in that it will list how to either get a BSEG survey or if you're a community that is in a bureau state, so BSEG is not used, such as the state of Mississippi, then how to get an equivalent rating from that state office. But all that is detailed in that programmatic support material. Erin, back to you. Thank you, Camille. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I was just responding um, to uh, to a question regarding um, solar panels um, and whether or not that would be an eligible application, um, not for the Building Code Plus Up program. I would encourage uh, you to get in touch with your state hazard mitigation officer to determine whether or not, um, from a you know continuity of services perspective, they felt that that was um, uh, a worthy uh, application for the state to submit. Um, uh, I've Pasted that uh, that link to the the state contacts elsewhere in the Q and A, but I will uh, finish typing that out as well. Um, if you have any questions for us after the uh, webinar wraps, you can reach out to Federal Grants at ICCSafe.org. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, oh, um, Terry. Uh, if we could come have you come back on video and audio uh, here, not to put you on the spot, but um, could you talk a little bit about how you navigated the application process? Sure. Um, so I'm the grant writer for the county. Not um, so I I that's something I do is is do grant. So it makes it maybe I'm coming from a different angle than somebody who doesn't normally do the grant process. It can be really daunting um, for. For the brick grant um, in and of itself, the competition one, the national competition one, I've applied every year and have not yet received an award on that one, but that's okay. Um, it is a very competitive program. Um, but so for me, I use BDEM's grant site and then I just, I'm going to answer the questions. I start with research, I start with finding. Uh, Whatever I'm trying to answer, however I'm trying, whatever question I'm trying to answer, I try to find the answers out there, some kind of background, some kind of documentation to strengthen what I'm asking for on why this will work. I think that's key when you're doing grants. Uh, you, you might know that this makes sense and you have common sense because of, of, of your job, but you actually have to prove it a little bit. Um, and so with us trying to digitize, I need to explain why having this in the field makes sense, why why this makes sense, um, the way that we need this training, why do we need this training? So I'm looking into finding those answers out before I sit down to write, write the narratives. I'm getting the quotes first and then doing that and finding a, a good timeline. It's actually, it's, it's not, not too hard. You just have to make sure you answer every question really well and in depth. I help anybody answer any if they're looking through if they need help. But uh, we have great 
partners at um, BDEM, they are super helpful when you have a question about something. So I'm really lucky there. And we did work with ICC um, on this somewhat. So asking, does this make sense? Is this a possibility? Can we do this? What do you think? How would you say that? Do you have any backing? I worked with them as well. So I hope that answers that question because it's very difficult. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Terry. Um, okay. Um, okay, there is a follow up uh, that we will um, pass on to Terry about uh, working with uh, your state contact after doing the research. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, in light of the declaration uh, of the Surfside collapse, would FEMA consider uh, adoption and enforcement of the International Property Maintenance Code an eligible application for the Code Plus Up program? I guess Camille, I don't. I think I would probably need to understand more about what okay. it is. To be quite honest with you, okay, um, we are we're really pushing that. Um, you know, we're, we're ensuring that the work that we're funding is going to be to the latest codes that are out. So, like, for example, you know, I'm trying to, if it's with the, with the international building code or national residential code, making sure that's aligning with 2021 and not, you know, maybe 2013, 2015, something like that. We're trying to make sure that whatever the latest codes that are applicable are what we're, we're helping to fund to. Um, I think it would be an interesting to learn more about what what that is, how it ties, and if that. I don't want to say no to anything that might not be ineligible, but we'd have to understand more. You all might know more than I do. Hopefully, you do. Great. Um, I see a disaster specific question from Sabrina Johnson. Uh, Sabrina, we will circle back with you uh, regarding that and get you in touch with the appropriate FEMA contact um, on that. Uh, uh, on that disaster in Mississippi, um, so that'll be a region four contact. Um, One thing I would note is a disaster declaration is not necessary. Well, let me take that back. BRIC does have through its law a requirement that um, an applicant have had a disaster declaration within the past seven years to be eligible for BRIC. Because of the pandemic COVID from 2020, it was the first time in FEMA's history that all states territories um, were declared at the same time or around the same time for a disaster declaration. Um, and because of that, everybody who could be eligible states, territories, um, tribe, federally recognized tribes became eligible for BRIC for seven years. So we have the ability to basically until Sometime in 2027, we have crossed that bridge. Um, so having a declaration is not either a requirement, nor does it keep you from being able to access BRIC funding. Great. Thank you, Camille. Um, one other question for you. Um, we've gotten uh, from a couple people uh, is regarding the internal state deadlines that have already passed. Um, is uh, is there anything that FEMA can do regarding those states? I know, like I said um, earlier, we heard that uh, the state of Utah announced um, they were pushing back an internal deadline for code related uh, for building code plus up uh, applications beyond um, their earlier internal deadline for a notice of intent. I'm assuming that um, uh, uh, Secretary Strickland, you've probably encountered this as well. Um, from a NEMA angle, is there anything uh, that either NEMA or FEMA can do in this situation? I'll start with the FEMA side, and Sarah, I'll mm -hmm. certainly hand it over to you. Um, we can, you know, what I want to do is encourage. I understand that our NOFO came out later, um, so I really appreciate everyone's grace and flexibility with um, our our delayed release of our 23 NOFA. We hope that by increasing our application window, pushing it back a full month, um, that gave some room for our applicants to still come complete their processes. We understand this is a new component 
It was not, you know, it was not something that people knew about until it was released. Um, so I, I, partic I, I want to encourage as these are, you know, we're, we don't know for sure how this will look in 2024. One thing I need to be able to show, and this is, I think, very important to realize. Aaron showed on his slide, I think, a very small, like what was it, about $7 million of funding that BRIC has put out in its first three years for building code work. And I'm trying to, in this cycle, go from $7 million of funding to like $137 million in funding. This is significantly more money than we have put in building code work in all of HMA over the past 30 years. So, you know, I think this is, I, I want to be able to show as much as we can success that this is necessary funding that we should be able to continue to have. Um, and so with that, you know, any flexibility our state partners can give in taking in these applications and utilizing this $2 million, we at FEMA certainly would appreciate. Mr. Strickland, I'll give the floor to you. Well, thanks. And uh, I, I really am gonna echo what you're saying. And, and we obviously, again, we're, we're back to every state is different and has rules and guidelines that they need to provide to uh, really kind of follow. And it, a lot of it also comes down to a maintenance of effort and whether or not they've got staffing that can handle these uh, sudden workloads. But um, I, I think one that we heard today that the ICC is ready and willing to help stay the way I hear it, states with this. And I think that's, that's a very, very positive perspective of it all that the private sector is going to step up and assist the states. We'll certainly take it back to our membership and, and encourage them to be as reasonable and as flexible as they can. Um, you know, and we kind of will we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you both. Um, uh, I see that we've been joined um, by Crystal, uh, also from Green County. Um, and uh, Wanted to give you an opportunity. Um, Terry uh, talked about mm. um, the sort of ease of use of um, for for the application process, um, but wanted to see if you had anything that you would like to add, Crystal, um, from your perspective uh, and how you found out about the program, and then uh, about reaching out to Terry uh, and successfully submitting. Maybe we're having some AV challenges here uh, with WebEx. Okay, Crystal, you should be good to go. Thank you. Um, anything that you'd like to add regarding how you figured, how you found out about the initial uh, opportunity for Brick, and then uh, connecting with Terry uh, and submitting what ultimately became a successful application? Well, I um, attended the VBCOA conference um, in the fall of 2022, I believe it was, um, and Lisa was there giving her presentation and talking about ICC and talking about um, all the available grants and things that were available to counties and um, those that enforce codes. And I had just been out into the, um, into the main corridor and was going through some of the vendors and um, looked at some of the software because our current software is from like the 80s um, and it's moves like a snail and does very little for us um, as a building department. So I had already looked at that software and was interested in that, but knew that we could never afford it, that our board would not approve that. So when she started talking about the grants that were available and you could use them for programs, you could use it from computers and different things, it sparked my attention. So the next break, I went back out into the lobby and talked to her and she gave me her card and gave me information. So when I came back to the office, I gave it to my building official and he said, take it to the grant writer. So Terry's in the same building we're in and I took it to her and said, see if you can help us. And she's, she's done, she's done all the legwork. I, um, without her, we wouldn't even be at this point because, um, but I'm just thankful that I was there that day when Lisa talked about the grant and, um, was able to make that connection. 
Great. Thank you so much. Um, we, we've got um, uh, a lot of uh, folks who are still on. Um, and uh, just, you know, as we reach uh, the hour mark here, um, here's what you can do now if you're interested in, in seeking uh, any ad additional information from us or assistance from us um, or any information uh, from your state hazard mitigation officer. Um, we're going to post this video and these slides on our website uh, as soon as possible. I'm happy to circle back uh, with any of the questions that we weren't able to answer uh, during the webinar today um, uh, with personal responses and really appreciate all of your interest in this. What we see is a transformational um, opportunity for federal assistance for code related projects around the country. Um, as Camille said, uh, her goal is to get as much of this 137 million dollars out in uh, in a single year's worth of uh, of awards here, um, which is obviously uh, you know significantly more than uh, has gone out for code activities in the past. But this is um, this is a, a great opportunity um, to uh, to receive federal assistance for the, these vital um, code related projects uh, in your communities. So. Um, please let us know if there's anything you need from the, the code council, uh, as you navigate this process and, uh, we are. Standing by, uh, happy uh, and eager to support you in these efforts. Uh, so thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks to all of our participants as well. Really appreciate your time and your expertise, uh, and, uh, and. Uh, sharing all of your knowledge uh, with our uh, audience today.